starting in Colossians chapter 4, verse 17. And, uh, and I love that verse, and Dion just read it, but uh, it says uh, Paul is writing to this guy, and he says, See that you fulfill the ministry that you have received in the Lord. And you know, um, I kind of wrote out a few things here when I think about that, but when you think about a ministry as this verse, he says, fulfill your ministry. When you think about a ministry, many times we think about a ministry has to do with if you're called to be a preacher or if you're called um, to do something in the church. You know, we always say, well, you've been called into the ministry or you've been, you know, chosen to, uh, to be a pastor or an evangelist or a deacon or an elder or whatever it may be. And, you know, that is true. You know, God does call people into ministry in the church. But I'm here to remind you and tell you today that God is also calling you and He's also put you in another ministry that's just as important as what we do inside the church, and it's your ministry outside of this church. Amen. Amen. Now, as we think about our ministry or service for Jesus outside of the church, I want you to think about what is one place outside of your home where you spend most of your waking hours at. Yeah, amen, unfortunately. I'm, well, I mean, I don't mean like, I love my job, you know. What place do you spend most of your energy and your effort at? What place are you at um, that automatically puts you into contact with people that may not know Jesus, that may not have their sins forgiven, that may not have eternal life? What place is that? Well, that place is your job. Amen. Your job. Now, I've kind of touched on this topic before several weeks ago, but just stay with me because I feel like God has me here today to remind you that your job is a calling. Yes, your job is a vocation. It is a ministry opportunity for you and for me. As the Scripture tells us in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11, everything in your life, is under God's sovereign control. What does that mean? That means God controls everything. God not only sees it. Listen, God doesn't only know things are going to happen. God doesn't just look down the halls of time and say, well, I know this person is going to be born, and I know they're going to look and act like that, and I know this is going to happen. God does that. But here's the next thing the Bible teaches us. God not only sees what's going to happen, God controls what's going to happen. That's how we can quote Romans 8, 28 and say God works all things out for our good and His glory. How can He do that unless He controls everything? Which He does. Praise God. I'm so thankful He does and we don't. Amen. So God controls everything. That means there are no coincidences in your life. There is no happenstance, no serendipity, no luck. There is no luck. Everything happens according to God's sovereign plan. What he has decreed or determined would happen before he even spoke the galaxies into existence. Everything is going to happen when God wants it, how God wants it, for his glory in the end. Amen. This means that your job that you're at, you are at that job for a reason. It's not an accident you have the job that you have. It's not an accident that you have co-workers. Those co-workers. It's not an accident that you live where you live and you are here today. None of those things are accidents. God has set all that up for a reason. Listen to me. God created you. God made you. And God gave you certain skills. He gave you a certain level of intelligence. He gave more to some and less to others like me. He gave... <laughs> that was a joke and nobody's laughing. <laughs> I'll admit I'm a lunatic. I don't care. He gave you skills. He gave you gifts. He gave you an IQ, a brain. He's given you employment opportunities for a reason. You have been called and placed by God at your job for a divinely set-aside purpose. And this purpose is for you to magnify and please your King, who is Jesus Christ. We are to do that not only when we come to church. Listen to me. We don't just worship and serve Jesus when we come to church on Wednesdays or Sundays or whenever we can make it. But we are to serve and worship and glorify Jesus seven days a week. Amen. When you're at home, when you're on the golf course, when you're sitting around watching football, 
When you're at your job slaving away from 9 to 5 and you just wish it would be 5 o'clock so you could go home, that's an opportunity for you to worship and glorify Christ. So many of us don't view it that way. We view it as this is how we worship Christ. When we preach or when we sing or when we give money or when we show up to church. And that is worshiping Christ if you do it with the right attitude. But that's not supposed to be the end of your worship. That should be just the beginning of your worship. You say, how can I worship and glorify and please Jesus at my job? You do that by blessing others, by doing good to others, by doing a good job at your job for Jesus, and loving others the way Jesus loves you. If you work that way, you are glorifying and pleasing and worshiping Jesus at your job. Amen. If you're not, then you need to repent and turn and forsake those things. Now listen to me. Your job, as long as it's a lawful and biblical job, for example, if you're a drug dealer or you work for the mafia, you need to repent. That's, that job is not glorifying Jesus, okay? <laughs> Going out and selling drugs and killing people, that's not glorifying God. But if you have a lawful job that does not contradict the teachings of the Bible, then it's a legitimate vocation and a ministry opportunity. Are you following me today? I've already lost you. Maybe I haven't lost you. Why? Why is this a ministry opportunity? Because, listen to me, God has ordained or chosen to work through your work to make this world a better place. That means if you're a stay-at-home mom, if you're a, a child care provider, a nurse, a teacher, a doctor, a lawyer, a dentist, an accountant, a farmer, a janitor, uh, the garbage truck man, who plumber, electrician, a secretary, a checkout person, you work for an insurance company, you're a waitress at a restaurant. God is choosing to work through you to make this world a better place for all of us. Amen. That's what Martin Luther, the great Protestant reformer, said way back in like the 1500s. He said, God is really the one behind our work. He is working in us and through us in order to promote human flourishing and well-being. For example, think about this. Martin Luther said it like this. He said, we say the Lord's Prayer. And if you remember, there's a part in there that says, give us this day our daily what? Bread. Our daily bread. Now think about how God answers that prayer. He answers that prayer through the farmer who plants the seeds and prepares the fields. He then uses, preferably, John Deere tractors to har <laughs> John Deere tractors to help to take care of the fields, to prepare the fields, and to harvest the crop. He uses the assembly men at the John Deere place to service and build and provide maintenance for those tractors in order to perform their service. God also then chooses to use factories to process the grain and, 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 the, and the rye or, or the peanuts or the cotton or whatever it is. It goes to a gin, it goes to a factory, and they produce something out of it. He then uses the factories and the workers at those factories to make a final product that he then uses truck drivers to deliver the final product to stores, Food Giant, Piggly Wiggly, Winn-Dixie, Walmart. God then uses the supermarket workers to stock those shelves and the cashier to check us out so we can purchase those products and that bread and be fed and have a better quality of life because of those products. That is how God chooses to work. Amen? Amen. Isn't that cool? Your job matters. Your job matters, man. You know, I hear all these people say, I've been called into the ministry. I'm a pastor. Well, that's great, dude. I'm real happy for you. But you know what? The stay-at-home mom's been called into ministry too. What higher calling could there be? To be a mother, to be a father, that's a calling. To be a grandmother, to be a grandfather, that's a calling, a ministry from God. What about the nurse that takes care of people in the nursing home or in the hospital? Where would we, where would we be without nurses and doctors? We couldn't go on. <clears throat> what about the people that work at the daycares that wipe the snotty noses and change the dirty diapers and make sure your kids are safe while you're out trying to provide a living? Could you function without them? No, you couldn't. Somebody would have to stay home and boy, we'd be, it'd be tough. Amen. Think about it. What about teachers that help teach your kids how to read and write and do math and civics and how the government works and how to be a good productive citizen? What happened if all that went away? We would have a tough society, wouldn't we? It'd be a difficult place to live. And God wants us to have a good life. And so God has chosen to work through all of our jobs in order to make this world a better place. 
All our jobs are important in God's eyes, and He uses our jobs to make this world a better place for all of us so that we can then be able to seek and serve Jesus Christ. You know, a lot of times where I teach at, it's not as bad now that we're a magnet school, but you would be surprised at the number of kids that are on free and reduced lunches. Even at Advil High School, Headland Middle School, wherever you go, you fall a high. There's a lot of kids that come to school hungry. Are you with me? They ain't had nothing to eat since they left school. And you know what? It's really hard for a child or an adult to listen and learn when they haven't had something good to drink and something decent to eat in 12 or 15 hours. Can you imagine? <clears throat> but you know what? God has put us here on this earth in our jobs, in our communities to show the love of Jesus to our communities, to our neighbors, to our co-workers. And if we do a good job at our job and bless those people, we can provide products to help make their lives better, that they get the things they need in order to succeed, that they get the food and water that they need. So then, if they have food and drink, they can come and they'll be more open to the things of God. And then we can teach them and share the gospel with them. And then they can get saved and have eternal life. Amen? Amen. That's, the, that's the point of it. It's hard to witness to somebody if they say, Sam, I want to listen to you, but I'm real hungry. My stomach's growling so loud, I can't hear what you're saying. What would Jesus say to do? So give them something to eat. Give them something to drink. Take care of them. And then, don't forget it, then share the gospel with them. Amen. Amen. Now, now that I have attempted to show you why you should view your job as a ministry or service to King Jesus, I just want to spend a couple minutes real quick. I've only got two things I want to say here about how you can please and glorify Jesus in a greater way at your job. So go back to chapter 3, verse 22. <clears throat> Real simple here. Chapter 3, verse 22. So your job is a ministry or a service to Jesus. Now how can we effectively please and glorify Him at our jobs? Well, in verse 22 the first secret to glorifying God at our jobs. And like I said, I've already kind of said this, so just bear with me. But the first secret is found in verse 22, and it's very simple. When you go to work on Monday morning, obey your boss. Obey your boss. Whoever God has put in authority over you, you obey your boss. That's what verse 22 says. He says, Bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing and respecting the Lord. Verse 22, obey your boss. Listen to me. Some of you have good bosses. Some of you have jerks for bosses. I know how you feel. I've had both. I've had some bosses that I wish I could slap. I really do. I don't mean to be ugly, but I do. And I'm just going to be straight up honest with you. I, I've had to pray in the Holy Spirit and cast out devils and rebuke the devil and everything else. Because, boy, I'm telling you, I had some thoughts there for a few times. I said, Lord, if I could just, you know, gosh, oh, this is ridiculous how things are going on around here. And you want to lash out. You know, you want to get in your flesh. You know, your ego wants to get involved. And I'm going to put them in their place. And they don't have a right to talk to me like that. Who do they think they are? You know, they realize who I am. They need to shut up. They need to get off my back and worry about the good of two shoes down there kissing their butt. And they let them get away with everything. And they're always riding me. You ever felt that way? Yeah. If you haven't, I'm, I'm happy for you because I feel that way. I have felt that way a lot. But the Bible tells us, the Holy Spirit reminds me in that moment. He says, Sam, if you want to worship Jesus at your job, if you want to fulfill this ministry that he's given you at this job, then what i got to do and you got to do is to respect and honor and obey those in authority whether they deserve it or not. Whether they deserve it or not, whether they're the biggest low lives you've ever seen, you respect and honor those in authority over you. <clears throat> you know, the Apostle Peter talks about that, I believe, in 1 Peter chapter 2, where he says we need to obey not only the good and the gentle bosses, but also those that are cruel and mean and unfair and unjust. Obey those in authority over you. Now listen to me. I'm not saying that if you are in a situation where you are being harassed, sexually, or you're being bullied because of your race or religion, or you're being clearly mistreated. I'm not saying that you should not file a complaint against your boss. Sometimes you need to do that. Amen. God doesn't want you to be a flat-out doormat where your boss can say whatever they want to say, however they want to say. Now, you can still respect them, and you can respectfully file a complaint on them in the name of Jesus Amen. and get the situation resolved. Because sometimes you've got to do that. Okay? So don't think when I say 
Obey your boss in all things. That doesn't mean you should not sometimes confront your boss or even file a complaint against them. The Bible says if you have a problem with somebody, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to go to them in private and be reconciled to your brother or your sister. If something bothers you that bad about your boss, you go to your boss and in love and respect and humility, share your heart with your boss and say, this has got to stop. Or I may just have to leave. And that may be the way God's leading you to go. Maybe God's leading you to hang in there. Like, you know, I'm kind of hanging in there right now. Because I feel like my job is a ministry opportunity to my co-workers and the kids that are up under me that I have a great opportunity to glorify Jesus at this job and I'm not going to give it up just yet. Amen. Nobody's going to run me off until Jesus says, it's time to go, then I go. I'm not afraid of nobody. Amen. And neither should you. So obey your boss. But also realize there may be a time for you to share your heart with your boss in a respectful way and possibly even file a complaint against him. Are you with me? <clears throat> now, the second secret to glorifying Jesus at your job and viewing it as a ministry is found in verse 23 here. So look at verse 23. <clears throat> it says, whatever you do, I love that, whatever you do, whatever job you have, whether it's an official job, a stay-at-home mom, maintenance man, a medical doctor, brain surgeon, whatever, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. Okay, let me just stop right there. Now, if we're gonna if we're gonna worship Jesus at our job and glorify Him, then our motivation has to be this: we have to be motivated by one thing when we get up and go to work. When I get up and go to work, I'm not primarily motivated out of greed. I don't go to a job to get rich. I don't preach to get rich. I don't go to work in order to boast my self esteem. Look at all these degrees I got on my wall. Look how smart I am. <laughs> There's people that do that. Well, I'm the, I'm the superintendent or I'm the state uh, department of education and you're nothing but a stupid old dumb classroom teacher. I'm going to come up in here and tell all you fools how to do it. You ever been around people like that? It just burns me up, man. It just really burns me up because they're no better than we are. Now, they may have a different title and we ought to respect them for that, but we're not to be motivated out of pride, out of fame, out of glory, out of arrogance. We're not to be motivated out of envy. What's to motivate you and me is this. We are to be motivated to love and serve Jesus. And the way that we can love and worship and serve Jesus at our jobs is by doing this. By loving, blessing, and serving others for Him. Amen. Did you get that? Amen. The way you worship Jesus at your job <clears throat> is by loving and blessing others for Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> it's just that simple. That should be our motivation. Our motivation is not fame and fortune and titles and glory and popularity. Our primary aspiration and goal is to please Jesus. That's what we want to do, right? Amen. That's our motivation. That's how we should work. We should work for the Lord. Okay? Now also implied in verse 23 is not just why we should work, but how should we work. When you go to work, if you want to worship and glorify Jesus at your job or whatever you may do, it's not just why you work, but it's how, how that you work. When you go to work, you should not be a liar. You should not lie at work. You should not be known as a gossip. You should not be somebody who is arrogant and haughty. You should not be someone who steals or embezzles from your company. You should not be somebody who does half-hearted work only when the boss is looking. You should not be someone who is just a people pleaser or sometimes called a butt kisser. When whoever's around, they kiss this, they kiss that, they change their tune. Whoever's around, they just kind of change and wishy-washy and they say one thing to you and they say something to somebody else. You ever met somebody like that? Amen. Sometimes I have done that. I have done it. Sometimes I have got in my flesh and I have done some of those things throughout the course of me working since I was 16. I have done those things. And God wants us to confess that and turn from that because if we live like that and people see that in us, is, are they going to come to Jesus if they see that thing, all that stuff in your life? Yeah. Is that glorifying Jesus? Is that going to make them say, wow, I want to go to church where they go to church? Okay. I wanna, hey, I want to know the God that they know because they're a good backstabber. <laughs> <You're>, <laughs> I know I'm being a little sarcastic. I apologize. But the point is, we as Christians have to put aside sin. Does that mean you're not going to have a bad day? No, you're going to have a bad day. Tomorrow may be a bad day. But it's the overall pattern and progression and direction of your life. 
Are you growing closer to Jesus or are you not? And people will see that in you. Yes. We should not be known as people who live and enjoy sin. We should be known as people who have the fruit of the Spirit. People should look at, you know, let me just say this. One of the greatest compliments I ever got was the first principal that hired me, Larry Norris. And I don't know if you'll ever watch this, but he's a great man. He's long retired. He taught in Dothan City for almost like 40 years as a teacher, a coach, administrator. And he came to my classroom soon after I was teaching at Beverly. And he came up to me in the lunchroom. And he said, you know what? He said, Mr. Davis, how are you doing today? I said, I'm doing pretty good, Mr. Norris. How are you? He said, well, I want to tell you something. I've kind of been watching how you've been acting, you know, with your coworkers. And I've kind of been watching how you've been doing with the kids, you know, in the classroom. Really, when you don't even know I'm looking. And he said, I just want to tell you that I can really see the fruit of the Spirit in your life. And he said, I really appreciate it. Amen. Amen. You know, that made me feel real good. And that wasn't because I'm some good, super spiritual person. That's because the Holy Spirit of God is at work in me, helping me, giving me the strength and ability to show Christ at my job. And now that I did it, I felt so good because I'm like, I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing, which is magnifying and glorifying Jesus at my job. Amen. Amen. That's what we got to do. That's what we got to do. I'm not the coach, man. I'm cheering y'all. That's what you got to do. Now get in there and do it. Execute the play. Execute the play. We have to put aside sin. We have to walk by the Spirit and His fruit will show up. Treat other... Listen to me. People at your job, treat them the way Jesus treats you and everything will be okay. Amen. That's all we got to do. We ain't got to get hung up in all these verses. I can't remember all that. You ain't got to remember nothing. Just remember Jesus. Amen. And the Holy Spirit, He is there to help you remember Jesus. Yes. When that kid smarts off to you at school and you just want to say, boy, you better shut up. That's what you just want to do when teenagers pop off at you. And God says, Sam, I've been patient and merciful to you. This is a chance for you to demonstrate kindness and patience and mercy to someone who doesn't deserve it. But I gave it to you when you didn't deserve it. Now you show it to them. Amen. You know, I had a kid ask me another day, so why are you so nice to us? <laughs> They say the weirdest stuff. said, you're the only teacher we lie. You, you don't never. I said, have you ever seen me get mad? He says, no. I said, well, you ought to come home with me. I get mad all the time at home. I said, but at school, I never get mad. I don't know why. You know, I, I don't know why. Maybe I need to get full of the Holy Spirit when I'm at home a little bit more. I don't know. But um, we want to strive. We want, it's not just why we work. We work for Jesus, to serve Jesus by serving others. But it's how we work. With as far as how we, we work. We don't want to sin. We don't want to be known for those things. We want to be known by the fruit of the Spirit. Even chapter 4, verse 1, Paul says, even if you have people up under your authority, you are to treat them the way Jesus has treated you. Look what he says. He says, Masters, treat your slaves justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master who is in heaven. Amen. Some of you are supervisors at your jobs. I'm not really a supervisor of anything, but I just supervise kids. But they're under my authority. And so how I treat them, how I talk to them, how I treat them with dignity and respect and value, and I want them to feel respected, and I want them to feel that, they have, that they're important to me and their opinions matter, and that they have value as a human being, it's up to me to communicate that to them. Because if I don't, God is looking down on me, and He's going to hold me accountable on Judgment Day for how I treat those up under my authority. That's not just as a pastor because he holds me accountable. It's like, man, you know, I'm really in trouble because I'm a pastor and I'm a dad and I'm a husband and I have kids and I teach school with kids. I got all these people I'm responsible for and God's looking at the, the man, the pastor, the husband, the dad. The, if you're at work and you have people under you, God is holding you accountable for how you treat those people up under you. Don't be a jerk to those up under you. Because you know what? You can talk Jesus all you want to, but if you're mean and you're condescending, and you're just vicious and you have venom and you're just a jerk to other people, they're not going to come to Christ if that's how you act at work. Amen. We have to repent of that today. I'm talking to myself as well. Because we, because we have to walk by the Spirit so they may see Christ in us. Also, excellence. How we work. We have to abstain from sin. Be active in the fruit of the Spirit. And Listen to me. When you go to work, strive for excellence in everything you do. Don't be a slugger. Don't be lazy. If God has given you a job, and He has, then you work at that job to the best of your human abilities. Do the best you can with what the good Lord gave you, and if you do that, He's proud of you, and He will bless you and reward you for that. Amen? Amen. 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 Give the Lord a hand clap. He's going to bless you for that if you'll be faithful. And listen, if you do all these things that the Apostle Paul is telling us, 
If you work ultimately for Jesus, if you abstain from lying and stealing and people pleasing and gossip and all that, if you walk by the Spirit, listen to me, you may actually lose in the short term, but you will win in the long term. Amen. What do I mean by that? I, what I mean is this. If you sin at your job, it may actually help you get a position. It may actually help you get a pay raise. It may actually make you more popular at your job if you sin, if you gossip, if you lie, if you steal a little bit, if you exaggerate. Oh, man, I can do all this. Or, you know, so-and-so down there, he ain't nothing but a hillbilly redneck idiot. You know, he can't do nothing. Put me in that position. People do it. They lie. They slander. They defame people. They make up stuff. They over-exaggerate. That's lying. That's stealing. Those are sins. Those are sins. And they may actually help you get ahead in your job. You may get that position. You may get that pay raise. Do a little butt kissing, a little smoothing here, a little smoothing there, you know, kiss up a little bit, change. You know, you know, don't tell, you know, that guy don't like Jesus, so you keep Jesus on the down low because you don't want to offend your boss. You believe in that Jesus stuff? Uh, I, <clears throat> that game was good last night, wasn't it? You ain't going to bring up Jesus. But you're around everybody else. Man, Jesus is my Savior. He's my God. I love Jesus. But when you're around other people, you're real quiet about it. That, you know, that's a sin. Because Jesus said if you're ashamed of Him in front of people, He's going to be ashamed of you when you stand before Him on Judgment Day. Amen. Are you with me? Amen. But you know what? By doing those things, it may help you get ahead temporarily at your job. I've seen it happen with my own eyes. Some of the biggest backstabber, two-faced, gossip, double-toned people hold the most power and position. It just burns me up. But you know what? That's the way it's going to be a lot of times until Jesus comes back. Amen. But let me tell you something. You may win in the short term. Those people may be winning in the short term, but you can't fool God. Amen. You ain't going to fool God. You may fool that boss. You may fool a lot of those parents. You may fool a lot of your coworkers. But you ain't going to fool the all-seeing eye of God because whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. For God will not be mocked. Galatians 6, 9 and 10. So this is Paul's message to us in 23 through 25. Follow Jesus and you will be rewarded. Because our aim and goal is to honor Jesus, display Jesus, and get Jesus' approval. That is what we want more than money, fame, or personal glory. Is to honor and get the approval of our King who is Jesus Christ. That's what we got to be striving for at our job. That's why we work. We work for Jesus. We serve Jesus by serving others. We love Jesus by loving and blessing others. And we want to use everything the Lord gave us to do a good job for Him so that other people may see Christ in us and it may open a door for us to share the gospel with them and lead them to Christ. Are you with me? Uh, yes. Those people that sin may get ahead in the short term. But in the long term, we're going to win. Our inheritance is from the Lord. Look what he says in verse 24. He says, Knowing that from the Lord you will receive an inheritance as your reward, you are serving the Lord Christ. Listen, the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong that he or she has done, and there is no favoritism with God. Amen. Those, maybe that boss, maybe that co-worker, maybe that person up under you, maybe they, they, they did you wrong. Maybe they talk bad about you. Maybe they disrespected you. Maybe they ignore you. Maybe they think you're just a idiot. You know what? All the bad things they've done to you, God's going to make sure it comes back on tenfold. I guarantee you that. All the sins that they've committed, they will not be able to escape the great wrath of God on Judgment Day. That's why you need to forgive them, love them, choose to do good to them no matter what, and let judgment and vengeance belong to the Lord because I promise you He'll pay them back for what they have done against you. I promise you He will. Amen? Amen. We don't have to take matters in our own hands. God's going to take care of it. You keep on serving Jesus. You keep on working for Jesus. You keep on loving and blessing and serving other people for Jesus. And God will reward you for what you have done for Him. Are you with me? Amen. This is what I want to close with. I have a great quote from Mother Teresa. And I think she sums up what we've talked about today. Which is viewing your life outside of church as a ministry. As an opportunity to serve and worship and glorify Jesus. Most... Uh, specifically at your job. And I love what Mother Teresa said, and I kind of want to leave you with this. She says this, she says, People are often unreasonable. They're illogical and they're self-centered. She says, forgive them anyway. She says, if you are kind to others, people may accuse you of selfish ulterior motives. She says, be kind to them anyway. If you are successful, you're going to win some false friends and some true enemies. Succeed anyway. If you are honest and frank with people, people may cheat you. Be honest and frank anyway. 
What you spend years building, someone might destroy overnight. Build it anyway. If you find sincerity and happiness, they may be jealous. Be happy anyway. The good that you do today, people are going to often forget by tomorrow. You do good anyway. Give the world the best that you have, and it may never be enough for them. Give the world the best you got anyway. Because you see, in the final analysis, it is between you and God. It was never between you and them anyway. Amen. 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 View your job as a ministry opportunity. View your job as an opportunity to go out there and worship and serve Jesus by why you work and how you work. And if you do that, God is going to use you to make an impact at your job. Amen. It's a great opportunity for you. So as I pray today, maybe there's some things you need to repent of. Maybe there's some things that you need to say, Lord, I've not always been the best employee. Some of you are retired. I'm jealous. So y'all probably just went to sleep through this whole thing. You say, man, that preacher's so cute. I'm retired. I ain't got to worry about that no more. Praise the Lord. And that's great. Some of you are getting close to retiring. Praise the Lord. That's great. But you know what that means? You need to be volunteering. Amen. <laughs> Never stop working. You stop working, you start dying. Is what I've always heard. So what I'm saying is, think about your job. Maybe there's something you need to repent of. Maybe there's something you need to ask God to forgive you of. This is the time we need to do that. So you can walk out of here with a clean conscience, a clean, pure heart, and you can go into that workplace tomorrow and you can say, Lord, I'm going to view this as an opportunity to worship and serve you by why I work and how I work so that people may see you in me. That's our goal right there. Amen. Amen. And I know there's things I need to ask God to forgive me of because I've not always been the best employee. At my, I've not always been the best co-worker. And I've not always glorified Jesus. And there's things I have to repent of today um, in regards to that. But I'm so glad we serve a great God who's, who's ready, willing, and able to forgive us of all our sins and to give us a fresh, clean start if we'll let Him. Amen.